Hello, my name is Evan Price, and this is the No Guitar Blues. My name is Fausto, and this is the story of how I got my first guitar. I'd been watching American Bandstand for years. I'd seen bands playing and music, listen to the music, but this one Saturday afternoon, it suddenly struck me. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to write my own songs. I want to learn how to play the guitar. I want to play in my own band. I want to dance around on stage, dress weird, and make money. And so I turned off the TV, and I walked outside, and I thought to myself, how can I get the money to buy a guitar? And I thought to myself, I can't ask my parents, because they'll just tell me money doesn't grow on trees, or what do you think we are, bankers? But, you know, I figured it doesn't hurt to try. So I walked into the kitchen, super nervous. I just I leaned up against the kitchen cabinet, trying to get up the courage to ask my mom, who was making tortillas for a guitar. And after a little while, I leaned off the cabinet and I go, Mom, can I have a guitar for Christmas? She told me. I don't know, guitars cost money. I said, well, what about for my birthday? She said, well, we'll have to think about it. I'm not sure. And so I walked out of the house with a buttered tortilla in my hand and thought to myself, how can I help raise some money? Because my father worked as a warehouse man and he made money, but not enough to pay for everything we wanted. And so, I thought to myself, I'm all I'm the lawns. So I walked in the garage, got the mower out, started pushing it down the street. Then all of a sudden a thought occurred to me, it's the middle of winter. Nobody's gonna hire me to do this. So I turned around, put the mower back in the garage. I picked up a rake and I went to get on my bike. But then I realized both tires were flat. So I took my sisters and I rode to the nicer part of my town. And I walked around, started asking people to rake their yards, nobody would hire me. And after three hours, I only got one job and it wasn't even for raking. I had to run to the store and get a loaf of bread and when I got back, the lady gave me a dirty quarter and an orange. And so I walked to the street, sat on the curb and started to eat my orange. And all of a sudden this dog came up and started sniffing my leg and I brushed him away and he wouldn't leave me alone, so I threw him an orange slice and he <laughs> slurped it up. And he looked at me with sad eyes, whined. And so I threw him an orange slice, <laughs> slurped that up too. And I looked at him, I go, why are you so hungry, dog? He just looked at me with sad eyes and laughing to myself, I said, what's the matter? Cat got your tongue? And then the thought occurred to me, this dog isn't like dogs from my town, from where I'm from. This dog was nice. He was a white terrier with beautiful white fur. He had a collar and these dog tags. And where I'm from, dogs aren't registered. And so I thought to myself, man, these people must be rich. And so as that idea grew brighter in my head, I bent down, petted the dog, and looked at the tags. That address was six blocks away from here. So I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna take the dog back. And so back in the dog, I said, come here boy, come here. And every time he got distracted, which was quite often, I'd peel off a piece of the orange, throw it to him and get him right back on track. And we finally got to this house. And this house was huge. Had a huge front windows, beautiful front door, so ornate, gold handles and everything. And as I walked up, I thought to myself, I can't, I can't do this. This is lying, I can't do this. But I figured I'd already gotten this far, so I might as well do it. And just as I was getting ready to turn around, the dog started to scratch at the front door. And so I knocked on the door, stood there, waited, nobody came. I rang the doorbell, stood there, 
and the door opened and this man came out in a nice white robe and he said, how may I help you? And I said, sir, is this your dog? I found him by the freeway and his tags say he lives here. He is your dog, right? And the man shivering in the cold winter air beckoned me to come in and said, yes, that is my dog. And as we got inside, I just, my jaw dropped. I mean, this house was beautiful. There was a TV the size of the front window of this house, a beautiful gold ornate domed clock, and these beautiful hardwood floors. And I took a breath in, and I could smell the sweet aroma of warm bread. And as I was doing this, as I was taking in all of the sights and smells and sounds of this house, the man looked down at the dog and said, you naughty Snoopy dog, you, Roger. You were down by the freeway and you shouldn't have been there. I bet you knocked over some trash cans too. And I didn't say anything. And the man said, thank you for bringing Roger back. He's like a son to us. I said, you're, you're welcome, sir. And then at that moment, he called his wife in. He said, honey, there's somebody here. And his beautiful woman came in, wiping her hands on a dishcloth. He said, well, who do we have here? And the man looked at me and said, um, this boy, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. I said, Fausto. He said, Fausto found Roger by the freeway. And he brought him back to us. And the woman said, oh, you're such a good boy. Your mother must be so proud of you. She said, would you like a turnover? And I said, um, what do I have to turn over? Thinking that she was gonna ask me for some yard work or help turn pans of raisins or something like that. And then she said, no, no, a turnover is a pastry. And so I said, well, sure, I'll have a pastry. And so she grabbed my hand, walked me into the kitchen and sat me down at this beautiful kitchen table and I looked around. This kitchen had beautiful, bright yellow wallpaper and copper pans with white cabinets. I had never seen such a nice house before. And just as I sat down, she handed me a big glass of milk and this, this pastry that looked like an empanada. And as I cracked it open, steam escaped from it. Smell of the sweet pastry glistened in my nostrils. And I thought to myself, this, this smells delicious. And I started to eat. And it was amazing. And as I finished it, I looked up and I said, thank you. And the woman asked me, would you like another? And I said, no, 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 I, I have to get home. So I finished my glass of milk. And as I was walking out the door, the man reached into his wallet and unfolded it and pulled up a bill handed it to me. I said, no, 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 no. I can't take that. It's, it's okay. And the man insisted on me taking it. And when I refused, his wife came over, grabbed it, and stuffed it in my shirt pocket and pushed me out the door. And she said, be safe now. Get home safe. And as I walked out the door, the door shut behind me, and this just feeling of guilt struck me. I just wanted to turn around and beg them to please take it back. But I knew they wouldn't. And so I walked back to the bush where I'd stashed the bike and the rake, picked up the rake, got on my bike, and rode home. I didn't touch the bill. I, would, I wouldn't touch it. And as I got back into my room, I made sure nobody else was around. I reached in and I pulled out this bill. It was a crisp $20 bill. I never had this much money before. And I thought to myself, I could get a guitar for this. Yeah, maybe from a yard sale or a secondhand guitar or something like that. I'm sure I could get one. But I just, I could not get over the guilt. And I wanted to go just confess my sins, but I couldn't because it was past 4.30. And that's when confession closes. And so, I hid the money in my front top drawer. And as I went to sleep that night, I woke up early. I got ready for church. Nobody asked me. I put the bill in my pocket. 
and I walked out and I said, bye mom, I'm going to eight o'clock mass. And my mother said to me, oh, you're such a good boy. I'm so proud of you. And then my brother sitting at the front or the kitchen table, reading the funnies, mocked her under her breath. Oh, you're such a good son. I'm so proud of you. I just ignored it. And I quickly hurried off to church. And as I got there, the preacher all of a sudden started talking about how we all need to be responsible for our sins. And I swear he looked right at me. But I thought to myself, there's no way he could know. I only did it yesterday. There's no way he could know. And so as we started, knelt, knelt, prayed, sang, and then the offering basket came around. I sat in the front row and I reached into my pocket. I pulled out the bill. I earned it between my palms and dropped it in the basket. And as I looked around, all these adults were staring at me. I mean, I was only a kid putting in $20 when they were only putting in three or four. And so as after I did that, I felt much better about myself. And, but I knew there was gonna be a second offering for St. Vincent de Paul. And so as we knelt and sang some more, the, way, the basket came back around. I reached into my pocket and I pulled out that grimy quarter and I dropped it in there. And as I was doing that, the adults around me dug deep into their pockets and pulled out fives and tens and dropped them in, wanting to make up for not donating enough money. And after that, I just, I felt a sense of relief. I walked out of church feeling a million pounds lighter. I felt so happy. I felt so good that when I got home, I played soccer with my older brothers and I played the best game of soccer I have ever played. And during one of the plays, I ripped my jeans. They were my good pants. I thought to myself, man, I wish I would have kept that $20 bill. I could have bought myself some Levi's. But I knew that I couldn't have kept that money. And so as I, as I got, as mom called us in for dinner, we sat down at the table and she said, and we were eating, and all of a sudden she said, you know, I think I remember seeing a guitar in your grandpa's garage when I cleaned it out. And I, I said, really? She said, yeah, it's a little dusty, but it should still work. I didn't ask for it. I waited for my mother to offer it to me because I knew I shouldn't ask. And as she was cleaning up the dishes, she asked me if I would like it. And I said, of course, of course. I ran up and hugged her and said, I'll do the dishes for the rest of my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was the best day of my life. No, wait, scratch that. Second best day of my life. The best day of my life is when I went over to my grandpa's house and he placed that bass guitar up in my hands, placed it in my lap. This guitar was huge. It was the size of a washboard. I ran my thumbs up and down the strings. The notes, eerie, beautiful, so deep. And my grandfather said, here, you shall place your fingers like this. And he reached over and put my hands on the guitar and now strum, I strummed. The beautiful chord resounded deep in my chest and my grandfather smiled at me, the smell of tobacco and aftershave radiating from him. After that, I was hooked, and it was much harder to play than I thought. But I'm still working, and I will get the best of this. But that's the story of how I got my first guitar. <laughs>